Hello. Today, I'm going to be talking about what constitutes a chess brilliancy. What are the factors which make up a move which shapes the chess world? Well, let's think. Perhaps the first thing that comes to mind is it has to be the best move, right? Well, even that, not necessarily. I'll give you an example. This is a game, or this is a position rather, that I read in the New in Chess magazine, an article by a guy called David Smurden. He didn't give the names of the players, but he referred to them as Charlie Chumpster and Frank Fluky. So that's what we're going to be going with here. So in this position, we have Charlie Chumpster as white with a completely dominating advantage. Not only does he have a queen for a rook and a bishop, but also the black king is very exposed and we have ideas of such as rook to e7 and queen to a7, which threatens four different mates in one. So. What do you think Frank Fluky played in this position? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? H5. Wow. So, what, what, so, the natural move, rook to e7, was now played, and after king to c8 and queen to a7, it looks like black is busted. White threatens queen a8, queen b7, queen c7, and rook c7, which will all be checkmate in one move. However, here, black goes rook to d1 check, sure, king f2, and it seems that after rook f1, king g3, h4, and king h3, black has run out of checks. Unfortunately, he did get a couple, but eventually, you're not going to stop all of the different mates that white is threatening. Or are you? Rook to f3 check. Pow. The only move that white has is g takes f3, but unfortunately, the humiliating bishop f1 is checkmate. Incredible. I was amazed when I saw this. But what's my point? Well, the move h5 is by no means the best move in the position according to the engine. And in fact, it actually allows a mate in 6. Let's see. Queen a7, king c8, queen a8, king c7, rook e7, rook c7, queen a7, king c8, queen takes c7, king b8, and queen b7. However, the move h5 gives white the opportunity to slip up. Black recognized that he had no chance of winning the game by trying to defend, and his only opportunity was for white to make a mistake. Fortunately for him, this is exactly what happened. Let's move on to the second example. Okay, this is a position from a game between Stefan Levitsky and Frank Marshall. In, I'm going to be talking about spectacularity. In this position, Marshall plays the move, get ready, queen to g3. Absolutely incredible. Wow. This is such an outrageous move to even consider. This queen can be taken in three different ways. Yet, it's a perfectly good move. Let's see why. If white plays f takes g3, black comes with knight to e2 check. The king has to move, and then the rook comes in, taking on f1 with checkmate. So, that's impossible. What else can white do? Well, let's, let's look at h, take, h takes g3. Again, knight e2, checkmate. The rook takes away the squares from the king. So, the only other way for white to take is queen takes g3. He has to take it because there's no other way to prevent queen takes h2 checkmate. So queen takes g3, knight e2 again, king h1, knight takes g3, king g1, knight takes f1, knight h, g takes h3, and knight b2. Hang on a second. Black hasn't actually won any material. So what has black gained from this sequence? Well, nothing apart from the fact that the spectators of the game started throwing golden coins onto the chessboard because they were so amazed at Marshall's, at Marshall's incredible combination. So maybe I'll take that back, he did gain something. The point is, this move is not even necessarily the best move in the position. However, it is such a spectacular combination that, co that not calling this a brilliancy would simply be in unappreciative. So, the next in our next example, I'm going to talk about impact or the significance of the game. This was a game between Magnus Carlsen and Sergei Karyakin, but it wasn't just any game. This was 
the tiebreak of the final game, the, sorry, the final game of the tiebreak of the World Chess Championship. So a pretty important game, I'd say. We're gonna, so as I said, we're gonna talk about the significance of the move or game. In this position, many of you I'm sure will have probably already seen this, but Carlsen plays the astounding move queen to h6 check. Although this is maybe not as complicated as some of the other tactics we have looked at, the, the significance of the game more than makes up for that. So let's just first let's look at why it's a good move. If the king takes, rook to h8 is checkmate. The pawn and rook cover the king's escape squares. However, it's not much better after g takes because after g takes because rook takes f7 is checkmate. Now, th while this is only a simple mate, well, well, a simple mate in two, this game it has been talked about and shown in countless YouTube videos and articles because, well, it's the final game of the World Championship, so it's kind of pretty important. So, this is so this so, so this shows us that the significance of the game and the move plays a big factor in what we consider a brilliant coup. Now let's talk about another interesting factor. Calculation. Let's take this position here. Many of you may know it as the Lucina position. And it was also a position which I arrived in in one of my first games in a chess tournament ever. I was white here. And as you can see, I have a pawn on the seventh rank. Unfortunately, I didn't know the endgame technique to win this. And, end, and I remember I ended up drawing the game and very frustrated because I felt like I was winning. The correct move is rook f4, and we'll see why in a minute. If white plays rook e2 with the idea of, kicking, of chasing the king and then bringing his king out in, with, with the intention of promoting the pawn, black will simply, not that, black will simply keep checking and white is unable to make any progress, as if he tries to run further away from the pawn, he will eventually end up losing it. So what can we do? Well, we've already seen it. Rook to f4. But what is the point? The idea is very simple. Well, black basically has nothing to do, so let's say he plays rook h2. Now we play rook to e4, king to f2. Again, this isn't an endgame tutorial, but I just want to show you the idea, because for completeness sake. And now the difference is that once we reach this position, white has the move rook to g4, and suddenly there is nothing that black can do to prevent white from promoting the pawn. But what, what am I trying to say? I did not find the idea in the tournament in the tournament game. However, if I had, it would have been a pretty amazing feat of calculation. Because not only do you have to see seven moves ahead, but also you have to have a quite insightful idea of, be, of being able to block the check in six moves time. However, it's not very likely that people would call this a spectacular or amazing brilliant coup, because, well, you only moved your rook up two squares, in contrast to with the last games, where pit players gave up their queen in, me in more than one different way. So, the point I'm trying to make is that calculations on its own is not going to get, is not going to assign a move brilliant, a brilliant tag. However, it's more based on, spec on spectacularity and significance. However, of course, calculation still plays an important factor. Finally, let's look at what in my, is, in my opinion, one of the quintessential examples of a brilliant coup. This is one of the greatest ge moves or games or ideas ever played. Emmanuel Lasker playing against Johann Hermann Bauer. In this position, Lasker has just played the move knight to h5. Bauer captures on h5, probably expecting the natural reply, queen takes h5. But he does not get anything like that. Instead, Laska plays the amazing move, bishop takes h7. Wow. So, the king is practically forced to take. If you go to h8, queen takes h5, comes anyway, and you're going to get mated on the h-file. So, king takes h7, queen takes h5, and king back to g8. What is the point? Well... You can't go rook to f3 yet, but what you can do is bishop takes g7. After king takes g7, the idea is queen g4. Now the king is so open and exposed that there is not much to be done. After rook to, h, rook to f3, 
the only way to prevent rook h3 checkmate is the move e5. Rook h3 comes, queen to h6, rook takes h6, and king takes h6. All of a sudden, we realize, wait a second, white hasn't won any material. But Laska looks further, and this is what I find amazing. After having seen all of that combination, he still had the insight to look further and find another idea. Queen to d7. Laska forks the two black bishops and therefore wins material. I find this, inc I find this game so incredible because... Laska not only saw such an incredible idea of sacrificing two bishops, but he had the in he but he went even further and better, and this is the reason why I find this game such a great example of a brilliancy. So let's talk about it in regard of our criteria. Firstly, the best move. We said it doesn't have to be the best move, but of course this is a very strong idea and is definitely the best in the position. Secondly, let's talk about the spectacularity of this move. Bishop takes h7, and then the follow-up of giving up yet another bishop has to be considered very spectacular. So I think we definitely can get a pass on that one. Next, the significance or impact of the game. While this may not be, for example, in a world championship match, this was played between two of the strongest players at the current time. Furthermore, this idea of sacrificing two bishops is so revolutionary that it has become that has that it has become a common theme that strong players have to learn and know now. So so it actually affected the game and changed the way that people think about attacking. So this of course is a very Im impactful and significant idea. Finally, let's talk about calculation. Well, I kind of already addressed this. He not only calculated this stunning combination here, but he went even further. He went the extra mile and found the move queen to d7. So I find that this game is a perfect example of all the cap of all the traits that we've been talking about that make a chess brilliancy. If you've made it this far into the video, firstly, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, do consider subscribing or leaving a like. And also, if you have any any examples of brilliancies or strong or nice games that you think I could have included or that you just think are interesting, do feel free to talk about it in the comments. I'd really like that. And again. If you have any feedback, I'd appreciate that too. Thank you very much for watching. Have a nice day.